on your screen, there's a text from reading from Psalms, and this is a fairly popular uh, reading. I see it different places quoted with scenes similar to this. Um, I want to re recall for you what we just sang in the song just before I came up. Uh, I didn't pick that song. Brent did. We didn't communicate. But there was a line in that that I found interesting. It says, the Bible stands like a mountain towering above all the works of man. And I think that that's a, a good thought to bring into this to start. In the text here, he says at the beginning, I will lift my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help, question mark. And if you're reading in the King James or authorized version, it doesn't have a question mark at the end. It has a period. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help. Um, you'll find... This varies throughout different translations. I don't know how to resolve that. But by the time we get to the second part of the reading, it's real clear what the psalmist is saying. My help comes from the Lord, the God of Israel, who made heaven and earth. And that would certainly include the hills. And we as human beings tend to look at mountains and see them as greater than ourselves, right? And we look at the scriptures and how the term mountain is used, and it can be both a figurative representation of kingdoms, but it can also be a representation of God and his son, right? God is a rock of salvation. Jesus in Daniel 2 is defined as a stone cut out of the mountain without hands that became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So whether the psalmist is looking at it from the perspective of he looks at all the hills, all the mountains, and says, where does my help come from? Well, it doesn't come from the governments of this world. It comes from the God of Israel. Or whether he was truly just looking at the mountains and saying, wow, whoever created this is a lot bigger in power than me. And I think it's fair to consider all of the above. Okay? So what we're looking at is the power of God, where, where our God's power comes from, and thus channeling that into this idea of where does my help come from? So we have to ask ourselves, what are we needing help with? And most of us understand our own mortality and what it is that we're trying to survive. What we really want to survive is death in the end. And every day there's things that we have to encounter. We get out on the highway. We, if nothing else, we have to prepare food and we hope that it isn't going to kill us, right? So this, this whole aspect of survival starts from these littlest ones here that are visiting us for some of the first times, right? These babies that are crying out, feed me, change me, whatever it happens to be. And even if they don't recognize the need that they're expressing and they're crying, it doesn't take them long to figure out that it's, it's all about survival and, and what I think I need. Okay, see if this thing will work here. There we go. So here's the topic today. Let God do the heavy lifting. And this started out a conversation that I had with, with someone, and uh, I, I made this statement to them, and they said, well, that would make a great sermon. And I kind of tilted my head and went, okay. And then other events that will reveal themselves later on today that uh, you will see why I, I went here. But this whole idea of what we're looking for is someone stronger than us 
Why do we need someone stronger? Because of our mortality. Someone stronger than us to pull us out of the situation that we're in. Okay? Things to look for in this study. How do we hit the up button? If we're talking about God's ability to lift, and this can be whether it's pulling us out of a situation, lifting a heavy load that we can't handle, or in the very ultimate sense, which we're going to see, resurrection from the dead to be raised. Why will he do it? He being God here. Why would God do it? When will he do it? And how or by whom will he do it? James 4 verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So this is clearly in the how or why range, right? <laughs> Cause and effect. I find it interesting throughout the scriptures, the conflict between the world with pride and those who look to God for their salvation and humility. And I think that this is about as simple a statement as we can find. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. But as you know, I'm, I like to do, reversing this, will he lift you up if you don't humble yourself? And we have to ask, in what, in what form should our humility come? In what areas do we humble ourselves? How does that work? 1 Peter 5, 5 through 11. Hi, how and when is the note to ourselves to keep thinking about. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you. Be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. We talked about love being the number one commandment in the adult lesson this morning a little bit, right? That was kind of a segment there. Love God with everything you have and love your neighbor the same way you love yourself. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I think it's important to look at that exactly what it's saying. It doesn't say God ignores the proud and gives grace to the humble. It says God resists the proud. So not only does he want to help those who are humble, but he pushes back on those who refuse to be. Therefore, as a result of knowing this, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. He's the source of help, salvation, right? That he may exalt you in due time. And this is a big part of the recipe of understanding this. The in due time. The implication there is a lot of time can pass before he saves us from the troubles that we have. And all we have to do is look at the historical record in the Bible of those people who God said they're doing it right. And what do we have in the historical record? A list of troubles, a list of lives submitting, a list of people who had to be patient for God to come to their rescue. And quite often, and since, let me put in, in parentheses here, 
None of them are still alive today. We don't have any 2,000 plus year old people to say, yep, God saved me. The only one that even has an immortality is at the side of God in heaven, and we can't see him yet, right? But the implication is, all of these people died. And Dean pulled up a scripture this morning in Hebrews 11, right? And what does it say in verse 13? These all died not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. So we have to understand the in due time part of this. And so the question can rise, so, so how does he help us? Because it says in the next verse here, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Does that help me now, or will it only help me later? Let's continue in the reading. Another ingredient. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, okay, we have to acknowledge that, that there is an adversary, the devil. And we'll talk about that more the next time I preach, Lord willing. Walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That, that sounds pretty negative, doesn't it? That sounds pretty uh, dire. Resist him. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So, so far we haven't read a lot of the good news. We were reading a lot of the setup for why you need a savior, why you need someone to help you, because there's an adversary and everyone else who agrees in your belief is experiencing him buffeting them as well. Verse 10, but may the God of all grace, and there should be a clue, right? where this is going, that God is gracious. He wants to help you. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and acknowledging of the truth, right? Yeah. This God of grace who called us to his eternal glory. Another clue. I could have highlighted a lot, but if I highlight too much, then you don't have anything not highlighted, and a highlight doesn't matter anymore, right? who called us to his eternal glory by, okay, one of the questions was, how does he do it or by whom? Through whom does he accomplish the lifting? By Christ Jesus after, there's the in due time part again, right? After you have suffered a while. Now, for those of you who are just entering this thing or considering entering this thing, which we call Christianity or belief or faith, it's important to note something here, that if there is an adversary, a devil, and if it's after you have suffered a while, then you need to prepare yourself like we all need to prepare ourselves for a battle. We need to prepare ourselves to, verse 9 says, resist him. And how do we do it? In what state? Steadfast in the faith. But he says, after you have suffered a while, this is the end of verse 10, that the God of grace will perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you but it doesn't come immediately. It's a process. It's uh, an extended time. It's a marathon, not a foot race, right? Or just a, not a sprint. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We had an introduction there in that last reading by 
Jesus, right? That's how he does the lifting. Jesus' own words on that. John 6, 38 through 40. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Now, we already talked about the fact that we don't have any 2,000-year-old Christians standing around us saying, yep, God saved me. Abraham, not here. David, not here. The prophets, not here. These all died. So the, so the process of logic says, if they're not here, and yet it claims that they were able to see this afar off, then what we're looking for is some way to become alive again, right? The resurrection of the dead. And we're not going to look at it today for the sake of time, but if you back up one chapter into the fifth chapter of John, Jesus explains very clearly what the intent is, what he means by raising them up at the last day. Not necessarily this day, or certainly not yesterday and the days previous, but someday future to this moment. I would love to think it was today, later, this day. Okay. In the interim, so what do we do in the meantime? And we had a clue in the, in the letter of, of Peter there to the church where he said, submit yourselves one to another. Love each other, right? Don't put yourself above the other person. Paul, in, in a letter to the people at Philippi or Philippi, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Yeah, Paul wasn't always around them. But now they had heard of his situation and, and wanted to help. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned... Why, why do I highlight that? I have learned. He didn't start out knowing these things. This was a process that Paul went through. By experience, he figured out, you know, they beat me up and I'm still here. I was wrecked in a ship, but I'm still here. I was hungry, but I'm still here. So while I'm alive... I can still have hope for the resurrection. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So what do we learn from that? Ask yourself a question. Am I better than Paul? If not, then expect that we might be hungry. We might be abased. Right? We might have to go through some things looking forward to God's help. To suffer need the end of verse 12. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's important to note that Paul didn't just say, I can do all things by my own strength. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. How did Christ strengthen Paul? 
We don't have time to read it all today, but Paul actually was talked to by Jesus. And he told him, get up off the ground, Paul. I have things for you to do. I know you're scared right now, but I have things for you to do. You're going to go talk to kings. Yeah, some of them want to kill you. But I'm with you. And there's more things I'm going to tell you that you need to know. But Paul also was very aware what had happened to Jesus. God's own son. What did the government and the people of that land that he was preaching in do to him? But what did his father do for him? Raised him up. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Yeah. Our job in the interim is to love each other, to be submissive to each other in the practice of being submissive to God so that later in a while after you've suffered a while in due time God will do what he will do 1 Timothy 6 6 through 8 now godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out there's some women in this room and one that's resting up, getting ready to go home, that knows that a baby comes into this world with nothing. But they're, as we call, birthday suit, right? <laughs> and he says, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. And this is hard sometimes for us to accept because, well, I like food and clothing, but I'd also like a new motorcycle, or I'd like a, you know, a bigger house, or I'd like whatever. This is not so much talking about that, but the understanding that if you're alive and you can put your clothes on, you still have hope, right? A living dog is better than a dead lion, right? Jesus had some words on this subject. Matthew 6, 31 through 34. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For, and here's, here's the, because, here's why he's saying, don't worry about that. You don't need to, and he doesn't say don't work for it. You will not find it saying in the Bible, don't work for it. What it says is, don't worry about it. Why? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And I think that's really important, that we plant that in front of our minds as we read the next things that we read. God already knows what we need. So then why does he want us to pray? If he already knows. Because part of the humility thing is saying, I can't assure myself these things. Please, God, I'm acknowledging I don't have the power to pull this off. I need you. And he goes, I know. I know you do. Thanks for saying it. But, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's a mouthful, isn't it, really? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. God's got it. He knows you need these things. But if you first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness... 
Not your own righteousness, or not righteousness as you perceive it, but the righteousness that he describes. Then the promise is, all these things will be added to you. But when? Remember that in due time thing? After you've suffered a while? And don't forget, your adversary, the devil. So what I'm trying to say here is, is we need to gird ourselves a bit, right? We need to prepare ourselves. Especially as we are entering a Christian walk, we need to be prepared for the fact that some things will buffet us, some things will resist us. Are we prepared for that? Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I, I'll confess, I've thought about that a lot in trying to digest what Jesus said there. It's hard not to worry about tomorrow, isn't it? But I have figured out that you can only change today. You can't change tomorrow. Tomorrow will come and it will bring what it brings. And sometimes we wake up when we're planning something, we wake up the next day and we have a sore throat. <coughs> or the car doesn't start. Right? Or we get a phone call, fill in the blank. And things don't go the way we planned them. So it doesn't do any good to worry about it because you can't face it till it gets here. But you can prepare. There's a difference between worrying and preparing yourself. If, if we were not to prepare, we would not be given this information. If we were just supposed to blindly fall into whatever comes our way, but no, we're told you be aware. You be ready because you have an adversary called the devil. You treat each other right because in your humility, God will be pleased and he will plan your salvation. Now, some of you will probably hear this and go, why did he bring this up on this topic? That Tony is always trying to prove he knows something or something. Sometimes the best things we learn are the things we have to struggle to get, that we have to think about, that aren't so apparent. And as we read this, I, I ask you to think, why did Jesus do this and say this? Okay. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? Now you might read this story and go, well, Jesus was just a tree abuser. <laughs> Jesus had a bad attitude here. He was just a... He needed to get some anger management training. I think we're obligated to think deeper than that. And of course, we don't have the time today, but if you read the context around this, and we talked about some of this this morning in the adult lesson, the people that were trying to trick him of the government that he was living under trying to work within, trying to teach, trying to not make himself stick out like a sore thumb so that Rome would swat him immediately, but trying, as Don was pointing out this morning, to very clever maneuvering, working his way through the cities of Israel, teaching these things that he had to teach, and still avoiding them, killing him before it was time. This is in that context, and this is near the end when he comes to Jerusalem. He happened to have left Jerusalem and gone over to Bethany when, in, just previous to this, 
And so he's walking, going back out, and this is when he sees the tree, okay? But there, the disciples are going, wow, how did the tree wither away so soon? So we have to ask ourselves, does the tree symbolize anything here? Could it be maybe a representation of the society that he was living in? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believe. Or believing, you will receive. He's talking to his disciples. And I just remind you of, of several texts here. In Revelation, the 13th chapter, after it explains what's going to happen what the governments of the world mixed with the religion of the world will do. It says that those that kill by the sword, right, die by the sword, and those and captivity has to be taken captive. And that this is the prayers of the faith of the saints, right? And in the 11th chapter of Revelation, it speaks of the people of God having the ability to even call fire down from heaven through the power of their prayers. And when we see the very opening of what's called the trumpets, the prayers of the saints ascend up and then fire comes off of the altar and it's cast into the earth. We have to see that God does hear our requests. God does see what the world is doing to us, what Satan is doing to us. He sees our needs. And if we see in the chapters following this what Jesus says will happen to Jerusalem, was that mountain taken up and cast into the sea? Well, you have to know what a sea means in prophecy. Were they taken and thrown into all the people of the earth? What did Luke 21 say, right? That they'll be taken captive into all nations of the earth. It speaks to the power of God. He speaks to the control that he has over everything and how we have to have that in our minds. Last reading here is a long reading. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. And it would help if we had time to read the whole eighth chapter, because you'll see there it says the Spirit of God works with our spirit and reveals things. So that helps us understand what a spirit is. The mind of God works with our mind. But that also we have to understand that there's some connection. God is able to see into our mind. Right? And we already read just a few minutes ago that God already knows what you need. We pray and ask for it, but he already knows what you need. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is. Ah, okay. This is throughout, the, this idea is spread throughout the scriptures, right? What do we read in Jeremiah about the heart? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? But, it goes on to say, but God searches the reins of the heart. He knows what we think. He knows what we need. Because it makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit of God knows our spirit, knows our mind, knows what we need, even though we may not be able to ask for it correctly. He still knows what's best for us. 
And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknow, foreknew, he also predestinated to be conformed. He didn't predestinate us to be just the lovely little creatures that we are. No, he predestinated us or predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. That he, the son, might be the firstborn among many brethren. Yeah, so what he's saying is God really wants to resurrect you. But in order to do that, He's predestined before. He's already said before you were even born and cute little baby in your mother's arms, he said, you need to conform to the image of the Son. Moreover, he predest whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, if this is true, we've already heard that we have an adversary called the devil. So the answer could be, well, the devil can be against us. The world can be against us. Remember where we started? I looked to the hills and say, where does my help come from? My help comes from the God of Israel. So we have to believe that God is bigger than, can lift, he can pull up harder than Satan can try to pull you down. He can pull up harder than your mortality can hold you down. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. How does Jesus make intercession for us? Once again, the book of Revelation makes it clear. If you're reading in the letters to the churches, it says that if you overcome, if you're an overcomer, then he will declare your name before God and the angels. Yeah, so when we pray in Jesus' name, what we're saying is we're invoking Jesus to, hey, tell your dad I'm your friend. That's what we're in fact saying. I'm coming to you, God, in the name of your son. And if Jesus looks at him and goes, yep, this person's one of mine, okay? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sakes, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. That doesn't sound very good. But we have to realize that that may be what we're destined for. Yet, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we sing our last song today, there's one that has expressed a desire to be part of the kingdom of God and to be part of the protection that God has promised and the lifting that God has promised. When we sing our last song, if they will come forward, we will hear their confession. Let's close with a song.
11 when they come to pick a song. <laughs> For 171. Oh, you picked it. <laughs> Why not now? Number 171. this kingdom in which we, through the resurrection of the dead, have mortality to live with him forever on the earth, enjoying not only the earth that he's provided for us, but the friendship and all the brothers and sisters that we have and that will be provided on that day. <coughs> Is it your desire to have a place in the kingdom? That's a good confession. Okay. I don't know what the situation is with the water. We have some. <laughs> Outside Joel's house. Is that acceptable? Sure. Two o'clock? Works. Objection? Okay. Make it two o'clock. <laughs> two o'clock. Okay. For those who wish to observe, there will be a baptism at two o'clock by Joel's house. And the uh, same thing always applies. Watch out for parking on sprinklers. Try to carpool if you can. We'll meet there and then we'll come back here to the church for uh, session. Okay, let's close our eyes and have a final prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are truly thankful for your words of hope and promise, as well as we are truly thankful for one who has stepped forward and expressed her desire to have a place in your kingdom. We look forward to the day when we can share with her these things. Until then, we ask that you would guide us and protect us, that you will comfort and heal those who are sick or injured, that you will strengthen those who spiritually are weak. And we do ask, Father, that you will forgive us when we fail you, that you will guide us safely through the coming days. And most of all, we ask that you would send your son soon and that we would be granted a place in your kingdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.